Japanese Tales, The Bridge. A governor of Omai province had many brave young men in his service. One morning, they were amusing themselves playing games, drinking, and telling stories when one of them said, Have you heard of Agai Bridge? It's right here in Omai. People used to use it all the time, but now they say no one can cross it, so nobody takes that way anymore. One of his listeners seemed to have heard of the bridge already, or perhaps he simply did not believe the story, because he quickly declared that he would cross the bridge. I don't care what kind of demon is blocking it, he continued. I'll get across as long as I'm riding his lordship's best horse, the roan. The others thought this was a fine idea. All right, let's find out, they cried. Let's see what of sort of courage you've got. The gathering got quite rowdy while they egged him on till the governor himself heard the noise and wanted to know what it was all about. When he found out, he was not impressed with the demon baiter's good sense, but he did not object to the use of his horse. This is crazy, the daredevil exclaimed. I'm sever sorry I ever brought it up. Shame, shame, the other shouted. Coward. Oh, getting across the bridge is nothing, the man went on. What makes me sorry is that I should ever have seemed to covet his lordship's horse. Loud voices objected that the sun was already high, and they were wasting time. The roan was saddled. Though he wished he had never opened his mouth, the man was determined to see the thing through. He smeared the horse's hindquarters liberally with grease, cinched the saddle on tight, and lightened his clothing, then slipped his wrist through the loop on the whip handle so that he could not drop it, and rode off. By the time he reached the bridge, his heart was pounding, and he was frightened half to death. But there was no turning back. The sun was sinking toward the mountains, and the deserted landscape looked indef indefinably bleak. Whips of smoke rose from the houses of a distant village. He gritted his teeth and pressed on. Halfway across the bridge, a woman was leaning against the railing, though from further off she had not seemed to be there. This, no doubt, was the demon. He looked her over with a deep misgiving. Under her pale cloak she had on a dark gown and a long red trouser skirt, and she was holding her sleeve over her mouth. She looked so pathetic that at first glance it was hard not to feel sorry for her. She might have just been abandoned there. The demon watched him coming with signs of mingled embarrassment and pleasure, and for a moment he could think of nothing but the desire to lift her up on his horse and take her away. But the thought that she had no business being there let him steel himself to ride on by. She clearly expected him to stop, and when instead he galloped past with his eyes tightly shut, she shouted, Say, are you just going to leave me here? I didn't ask to be dropped here in the middle of this bridge. You could at least take me on to the next village. Her hair seemed to swell and thicken as she spoke. He only whipped his horse on harder. You brute, she screamed, and the earth shook. Now she was after him. Sure enough, he thought, and prayed to Canaan to save him. Despite the horse's tremendous speed, the demon slowly caught up. But the horse's rump was too thoroughly greased for its clutching hands to find a hold. Glancing back, he saw a red face, with one amber-yellow eye as huge and round as a cushion. The thing was greenish and nine feet tall. The three fingers on each hand had five-inch knife-like nails, and the hair was like a snarl of weeds. Maddened now with fear, he galloped on, calling on Canon with might and main, till at last he reached the village. All right, I'll get you next time, said the demon and suddenly vanished. Panting and exhausted, the man dragged himself back as fast as he could to his lord's mansion and arrived at twilight. He was too weak to answer the barrage of questions that greeted him. All the household could do was try to bring him round. But when the governor, who had been concerned all along, finally asked him to tell his story, he did so. The governor scolded him for having risked his life over a trifling wager, then gave him the horse. The man went home well satisfied and told the tale again to his horrified family and servants. 
A spirit began to haunt the house after that, and the man called in a Ying Yang diviner to find out what the trouble was. The diviner told him to be very careful the next time the day when he had thwarted the demon came around. When the day came, the man shut his gate to all comers. Now he happened to have a younger brother who had gone off with her mother to Mutsu in the provincial governor's entourage. This was the day when the younger brother came back and knocked at the gate. His older brother refused to talk with him except through a servant, and the only reply he got was, I am in strict seclusion, I'll see you tomorrow. Try somewhere else in the meantime. What do you mean, the younger brother protested, the sun has already set. I can go somewhere else, I suppose, since I'm alone, but what am I going to do with my baggage? I only just managed to come at all, and today was the only day I could find. Our mother has passed away, you see, and I wanted to tell you myself. The elder brother had been worrying about his mother for years, both because she was old and because he loved her dearly. When this news was relayed to him, he broke down in tears and had his brother let in. The younger brother entered, all in black, and first had something to eat on the veranda. Then the older brother came out to talk to him. Both wept. The older brother's wife stayed behind the blinds that curtained the veranda off from the house proper and listened to the two men's conversations. Suddenly, for no reason she could see, the brothers fell to grappling fiercely and crashed over and over, locked together on the floor. She shouted at them to stop, and when her husband got his younger brother under him, he demanded the sword he kept by his pillow. She answered that he must have gone mad and refused to budge. Give it to me, he barked. Do you want me to get killed? Just then, the younger brother turned the tables, got on top, and with one crunch, bit off his older brother's head. As he fled, he turned back to glance at the wife. That's better now, he exulted. His face was the demon's. Then he vanished. There was nothing the distraught household could do. As for the awful intruder's baggage, it turned out to contain only animal bones and skulls. So the man did die for a petty wager, and everyone who heard the story called him a fool. After playing a few more tricks upon the settlers, the demon disappeared. <laughs>